Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me and I hope the technology stands up for the next half an hour. Um, so usually about twice a year, Brian and I have a, a catch up, usually at the APF show or the Convo show or the Royal Welsh, one of the big events. And um, we have a long chat about trees and forestry and we put the, the forestry world to rights. And the last time we did this, Brian suggested that I should try and um, present our thoughts and ideas as a presentation. And um, earlier this year, he kind of caught up with me and twisted my arm. So this is what we're going to try and do at this meeting is some of the uh, ideas and suggestions that Brian and I, I have sort of presented as a kind of 25 minute lecture. And with about, uh, I think I've got about seven or eight slides. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about future forestry. And unfortunately, I don't have any magic bullets. I have no quick fixes or radical solutions. But I think well-managed forestry is a splendid thing. And I think we should have a lot more of it. And hopefully in the next 20 minutes, we're going to discuss some of the issues and the, some of the challenges around that. So I, I was looking for a, trying to find, trying to find a, an opening slide to use. And um, I found this one, which is a, a a fork in the road, a binary choice. And a lot of times when we're talking about land use and about forest management, we often end up having these binary discussions as though there is a simple choice between uh, rewilding and natural regeneration or tree planting, whether it's sheep or it's trees, whether it's native species or exotic or alien species, as some people seem to call them, or whether it's about farming or nature or as today's um, today's social media discussion it's all about trees and heathland again i think integration is vital i don't think it is a binary choice i think we have to make lots of choices and take lots of different routes at the same time and if we are going to tackle the climate and biodiversity emergency then in reality reality we need to learn about how to embrace this complexity and how to learn to take these multiple paths at the same time Today, I'm gonna to talk a lot about growing timber because I think that's what's really important. That's my background is growing timber. And I think, but I just wanna be really clear and obvious at the beginning to say that we need more trees and woodlands of all types for lots of different reasons, for biodiversity, for recreation, for water, for timber, for agroforestry, and everything else. And I think one of our big challenges in England is that the need for this more integrated and strategic approach to land use. And if we don't have a, a strategy, then at least we need a framework of some kind to have these discussions. And I hope ELMS can help us do that in the future. And I think otherwise, we often we, we seem to have challenges around where we're talking about a very piecemeal approach. We're looking at a specific issue in a specific area, and then we keep having these similar discussions. So Brian gave you a quick introduction, but a bit more about me, why I'm why I think I've got um, why I'm having this giving this presentation tonight. So. I'm a chartered forester and in the past few years I've been described as both an in industry shill and an idealistic dreamer. So I think I'm what some people refer to as a, a hardline centrist. I work as an independent consultant on a couple of UK forestry projects, but my, I suppose my bread and butter at the moment is trying to pull together large scale projects in places like Brazil, Ghana and Uganda, where we're trying to blend productive plantation forestry with agriculture, with rural development and with conservation. And I think my background in the UK has been a really good preparation for that. And most recently I was the technical director for Comfor for about six years. And before that, that I worked as a, a forest manager for Till Hill uh, in North Wales and in Scotland. And then I did it quite a, uh, a while over, working overseas for their parent company, UPM. So, in 25 minutes, I'm gonna rattle through what I think are some of the big issues around future forestry in England. And I thought of doing this in different ways. Um, let's see if I can change slides. That'll be the first thing. Ah, there we go. And I, so in 25 minutes, I'm going to rattle through what I think are some of the big challenges and drivers around future forests in England. And I thought of doing this in different ways, but I think the simplest is to ask some questions. I've only got about 25 minutes of which I've wasted five already. So I'm gonna ask some short questions, but short questions are the easiest to ask and the hardest to answer. And so my short questions are, why should we be growing more trees? What sort of trees should we be looking at and considering? Where should we be growing these trees? And finally, how, who, who should be growing these trees and who are the big changes here? 
And there's a, forest, a forester uh, who worked for the United Nations FAO in the 1960s and 70s called Jack Westerby. And Jack Westerby famously said, forestry is not about trees, it's about people. And it's about trees and only so far as trees can serve the needs of people. And I think how we perceive what those needs are and how we balance them is the big question. My need to wander through some ancient pine wood up in, up in the Cairngorms is as strong as my need for low carbon construction in the house that I live in or to have um, to, uh, for my need for bioplastics as an alternative to sort of fossil fuel. And when I think often when we talk about the Forest Commission or others talk about societal attitudes, the general evidence is that most people, the vast majority of people actually do want to see a lot more trees. And though it might not always feel like that when we're trying to do uh, new woodland creation applications. And so I just wanted to be clear when I'm talking about more productive woodlands, I, I'm not kind of a lot of people have a perception that productive and commercial forestry means that sort of the square rectangular blocks of uh, the 1970s and the 1980s. And what I what I think we could have is what we have in this image on the left here is productive landscapes that have got forestry and productive woodlands at the heart of them, productive woodlands and forests of a, a range of species and a range of and management types. And this image is from a um, uh, there's a PhD, uh, a scientist called Vanessa Burton, who did a PhD up in Edinburgh, who's now got a PhD and is working for forest research. And she has a really good blog. If you just Google Vanessa Burton and this concept of green gold, you'll find it. And I think this concept of green gold and forestry integrated into the landscape and into rural economies, I think, is, is really important. And if we're going to try and talk about how we need more and better managed forests, then we need to help people visualize what that might be. And I think this image is a really good way of doing that. So you'll, I, am, I know it says when on there, but I'm not going to talk about when, because we all know the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the second best time is now. So, okay. So this is a slightly complicated and very, very messy slide. I've got at the end, <laughs> Um, I'm going to, I've got a slide with some references. So all, most of the images I'm using, most of the tables and the graphs are all in, uh, are all from a series of documents and they'll all be on the final slide at the end if you want to, if you're, if you're particularly interested in seeing where they've come from. So I've got five questions, why, what, where, how and who, and this is, this is the why. So why should we be growing more trees? Well, I think one of the main reasons we should be growing more trees is that we need to reduce CO2 emissions. And after water, concrete is the most used material in the world. Making concrete and cement contributes about 8% of global CO2 emissions. And the top right graph on this, on this slide shows that the three most used materials in the world are construction sand, gravel, and limestone. So that's basically what, obviously, they're the raw materials for making cement and concrete. And in... I, I, live in, I, should, I live in Edinburgh in Scotland and about 80% of all the new build houses up here are timber frame. In England and Wales, it's the other way around and only, only about 20%, 20, about 25% now of new houses are timber frame. And we can reduce CO2 emissions by reducing demand for concrete and steel and switching to engineered timber products from sustainably managed and well-managed forests and plantations. And it's not just concrete and timber. We could also be using lignin to make bioplastics. And lignin is a, um, is a co-product from paper making. When I started working for, I used to work for UPM and spent a lot of time going to shot and paper in North Wales. Lignin was very much like a, a waste product and it was just burnt in the boilers. And lignin is now a very, a very valuable product and it should, is one way to help us make bioplastics. And something like about 60% of all the textiles we use are also oil, fossil fuel based. We could be using a whole range of natural fibers, obviously um, wool for uh, wool and cotton, but we could also be using woody woody fibers as well to be making to making more textiles from lignin. And globally, demand demand for forest products is predicted to more than double by 2050. So if I plant some Sitka spruce tomorrow, it should be ready to harvest in about 2050. And the UK is the world's second biggest net importer of forest products. Only China imports more forest forest products than we do and currently we offshore about 80 percent this is the uk as a whole of what we use 
And I think that's unsustainable. I think we need to be taking much greater responsibility for our forest product footprint. And the UK and Ireland have got great climate for growing, great climate and conditions for growing trees, timber and fiber. I think we've got some of the best conditions for growing, uh, growing, growing trees in, uh, in the whole of Europe. And I think the why should also, when we're talking about the why, the why should also be for more multifunctional woodlands, for recreation, for carbon, for biodiversity. And one of the big challenges I encounter often when I'm talking about forestry is this concept that a single woodland can be multifunctional, particularly if one of those multifunctions is growing timber. I think we can be good for biodiversity and grow timber and be a nice place to go for a walk. We can manage for carbon and produce timber at the same time. And that seems to be a real challenge to communicate. People and organizations seem to prefer to have an area colored on, in on a map and be told that's the native woodland area, then over here is this is the productive area. And going back to my sort of binary uh, choice of routes on that first slide, I think we need to be much more, uh, much better at kind of having this multifunction and multifunction in space and over time. And that's, that's quite, a, quite a complex one thing to discuss sometimes. So what should, be, what should we be growing and um, yeah, what, what species and what types of trees should we be growing? And I suppose the easy answer is that is we should be growing more of everything. We need more of all woodland types. And I was really struck, I came, my sort of one trip anywhere last year was I came down to Devon in September for a few days holiday to, and to visit some friends. And I was struck by the number of beech trees that had already turned brown up on top of some of the hills. And it was due to the, that dry weather we'd had in the early summer. And of course, a lot of the ash was already succumbing to cholera, and uh, I think there were some early signs of acute oak decline and P. remorum. So there's no doubt we need, when we're talking about what we plant, that we need to be focused on in increasing the resilience of our woodlands, so uh, woodlands of all types. And particularly with a rapidly warming climate, I think we need to be thinking smarter and willing to try a wider variety of species, whether that's, as I say, for woodlands of all types. However, I said I was interested in growing timber and fibre and lignin, so I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. And what we grow obviously depends on what materials we want, the why, and also where we are growing it. And obviously different trees and different timber have different timber and fibre properties and they grow at different speeds. They like different types of weather and different types of soil. And I think as, as our climate changes, we need to be much we need to be much lighter on our feet and willing to think uh, change what we grow and how we grow it more rapidly. And obviously, some trees have a higher value per ton when they're mature and a lower value when they're being thinned. Lots of people and um, there's lots of great Douglas fir down in the southwest of England, and it's highly valuable for construction timber when it's about 50, 60 years old. It's a lot less valuable when we're trying to grow first thinnings at 20 or 30 years old, which is for a lot of people when they're going to be getting that first return on any investment. And one of the criticisms around commercial forestry is we're often focused on a relatively small number of species, which is a bit like commercial agriculture. And much of the UK produces a fairly narrow range of crops and animals, whether that's cows, sheep, barley, spuds, or wheat. And I think we need to be focused on our markets as well when we're thinking about what we grow. So there's a growing demand for plastic-free packaging, which you can see in the top right here. And these food containers are made by Ig Igerson up in Workington, out of they're probably out of Sitka Spruce, these. The kitchen units here are um, made by Egger, so it's uh, um, produced in their factory up in Hexham near Tequila. And the house is, um, is an off-site construction designed by a company called Macca, who are up in the up in the far north of Scotland. So, all of these products we can be, we can make out of UK timber, and we can grow that here. And so, that's a great way to we want to develop and um, reduce our carbon footprint, and reduce um, sorry reduce our carbon footprint and reduce our imports and support our rural economy. We can be growing timber timber and fiber that supplies these products. I think also one of the reasons we do, obviously when we're growing a small number of species is because downstream, the harvesting machinery, the sawmills, the pallet manufacturers, carton makers all want a consistent product. They want a product that has the same color and strength and feel as last week or last month. A small number of species enables people to specialize and make mills more efficient. Similarly upstream, tree nurseries become, become more efficient by growing a smaller range of species. 
We know what happens when tree nurseries in the past have tried to produce a wide range of species to try, to try and second guess demand. It can be quite high risk and very expensive and, and can cause real problems when there's uncertainty in the grant schemes. And land availability is also an issue. In the UK, forestry has often been pushed onto marginal land, often poorer land for agriculture, and hopefully now trying to avoid environmentally sensitive areas. And we'll struggle to grow good quality oak on PT podsols at 300 meters in Northumberland. We're also going to struggle to grow spruce in a lot of the south and the east of England at the moment with future climate predictions. So to summarize the what, I think it probably will still be mainly coniferous timber, but of a, perhaps a wider range of species. I think as Brian would tell us that it's going to include some eucalyptus, hopefully a lot more older and willow, probably some more Scots pine. And I think there seems to be a bit of a renaissance around birch as well. The big challenge, obviously, with growing, having reliance on a small number of species is that risk of pest and disease and of climate change. But it's worth considering that the entire Scottish whiskey industry is dependent on a single species, which is barley. So on to the where. So the why and the what, but where are we going to plant these woodlands and forests and plantations? So here are some of my thoughts around the where. And it's easy to say where not to plant trees. We're constantly told where not to plant trees. We're obviously high value natural habitat, high quality agricultural land, peatland, heathland, etc. And obviously there's some very big changes going on in the farming sector at the moment. And at least in, in, in I want to see up, in, up here in parts of Scotland, we are seeing more farmers integrating trees into their farm businesses. And I think there's also a change in the di dynamics of some of the larger states with tenant farmers. And there's issues there with tenant farmers and um, high land prices for um, afforestation. But one of the interesting things in, in Scotland at the moment is that I think the average size of a new woodland is about 25 hectares. So what some of the commentators there are saying is, that, yes, there's some very big, some very big new planting schemes, but there's also a lot of farmers planting trees in the kind of 20, 30 hectare bracket. And this obviously isn't happening in England for a, wide, for a variety of reasons, not least around land price. But if you're unsure of your future farming economics, and I don't think anyone can be sure of farming economics at the moment, then perhaps growing a crop of timber on perhaps 10 or 20% of your farm could be a good hedge against that uncertainty over the next 20, 30, or even 40 years. I also think there are opportunities for growing more woodlands and forests in urban fringe areas, where they could also be providing great recreational opportunities, particularly obviously in lockdown at the moment, where the, 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 the benefit of having good places to go for a walk on your doorstep is, is being highly valued. And you know, we, we have Mersey, the Mersey Forest and the Red Road Forest are really good examples, but I think we could be making those forests much more productive as well. But the challenge with growing woodland in the urban fringe is that that requires local authority engagement and obviously around issues around planning control and regulation. A landowner is unlikely to plant trees if they think that their land might be have a future commercial development value. Finally, or perhaps firstly, I always think about markets and transport. In the north of England, we have some very efficient and heavily invested sawmills and pro sawmills and processes. We have a few further south in uh, Welsh marches, Cronuspan at Chirk, and obviously some in the some re really great examples in the southwest as well. And perhaps we should be looking at promoting commercial forestry closer to those major sites. If they're closer to those the mills and processes, we reduce haulage, road haulage and timber miles. But I also think our forestry sector could and should be a lot more diverse. The industry we have reflects land ownership patterns. I think we also need a lot more small sawmills, which are more, diver more diverse and can cope with a wider variety of species. Obviously, there's a big challenge there is how do these sawmills compete on price and efficiency? And that obviously reflects some of the challenges in the agriculture and the food sector. I'll talk a bit more, a little bit more about that when I come on to the, onto the who in a minute, in a minute. So the how, how, how are we going to deliver this change in land use policy, this change in construction habits? What are the drivers here? So if I had a magic wand, if I was first minister of England for the day, I would, I think I would tax, be looking at taxing carbon and carbon dioxide. And I think that would shift the balance from a fossil fuel based economy to a, hopefully towards a circular renewable bio-based economy. 
I think would help have an impact on land use and how we value, regulate and support different types of land use. And I think government leadership here is key. And I think that to date has been the big difference in woodland creation and attitude towards forestry between Scotland, England and Wales. Zach Goldsmith talks a good game, but I'm not aware that he's ever set foot inside a sawmill. If I'm wrong, I'm, I hold my hands up. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware that he has. We could also talk about the how of woodland creation. Well, that's a bit easier. And Kew Gardens recently released their 10 golden rules for forest restoration, which is great. But we have woodland creation standards and forest management standards in the UK. We've had them for over 20 years. We have the UK forestry standard and the UK woodland assurance standard. The latter is reviewed every five years. It's, I think it's a really good scheme. It's a good standard. It's not a perfect system by any means. And if people want to improve it, please get involved. It's under review at the moment. There'll be another round of public consultation in the next few weeks. So that was the, a quick run through the how, so the who. So this is my last, this is my last of my questions. And I think who, as I said before, who and people I think is at the heart of this. If anyone's tried to recruit or hire a forester, you'll know they're in short supply. Getting hold of good planting teams is also really difficult. They're in short supply. Good chainsaw operators, rare as hen's teeth. If you're a competent harvesting machine operator and you've got the tickets, then you've got a ticket and an opportunity to work all over the world. So how do we attract more people to work in our sector? If we want this post-COVID green recovery, then we will need a lot more people working in our sector. And what about the people and organizations that own our forests? I think one of the reasons we have the type of forests and plantations that we do is because of the type of people who own some of these forests and plantations. And we know that in some parts of the UK, the land ownership is quite concentrated. And I've already mentioned briefly on the issues of scale and economies of scale and of long-term investment, means that forest ownership tends to be very concentrated. And that means a limited range of, often of ownership objectives, which can mean a limited range of species and management choices. And that in turn means a limit, often a limited range of sawmills and fiber processing to a degree. It's a very broad generalization. And if anywhere bucks that trend, I think the, south, the southwest of England does buck that, is the, is the exception to that rule. But it's certainly true about um, other parts of England, particularly the north of England, and particularly in Scotland. So I think we do need large scale forest owners and some very light, efficient, large sawmills, but we also need a range of smaller sawmills and perhaps community based forest owners. This isn't either or, this is very much and, and, and. I used to work for a large Finnish forestry company, UPM. We owned about a million hectares of forest in Finland. We also purchased timber and fiber from 30, 30,000 suppliers. Nearly every family in Finland seemed to have an uncle or an aunt or a cousin that owned a small area of forest. So in this who section, I think there are two key areas that I'd like to see more growth and faster change. And that's around integrating farming and forestry, not just agroforestry, but more farmers growing more trees and growing timber is really just slow farming. And also, I think I'd like to see more and better examples of community ownership. And communities are interested in growing trees and managing forests for a wider range of purposes. We could and should also have more councils owning and managing forests for their local communities. Why not have public sector pension funds invested in sustainable forests? There, is a social ha there are social housing trusts in Wales looking to invest in forests to grow timber to build future homes. We often talk about sticky money in rural development. What could be stickier than building social housing from homegrown homes? Finally, in the WHO, I want to talk a little bit about facilitators or forestry advisors. I think we need a lot more. FWAG and ADAS and others do a great job. But in the same way, a farmer gets a regular visit from a vet or an agricultural consultant and listens to their advice. I think we need forest advisors working with these consultants and helping farmers and woodland owners integrate woodlands and trees on their farms. So some of these ideas about alley cropping, et cetera, are great, but I've seen farmers using blocks of conifers as green barns to shelter stock in over winter and to reduce their, their feed bills for their for sheep and for beef cattle. And too often planting trees is often framed as taking the land out of production. Again, I think here there's an opportunity to embrace that complexity. We could have woodlands that serve as a, a green barn for 30 or 40 years and are then harvested whilst more trees are planted elsewhere.
So, to, sorry. To conclude, to summarize, I've rattled through some very big issues. I've made some, I apologize, I have made some very broad, sweeping generalizations. But I hope I've been able to show you some of my thinking behind the questions of why, what, where, how, and who. And that the demand for forest products is rising steeply around the world. I think if we're using those forest products to replace fossil fuels and materials like concrete, that's a good thing. As long as we're using that material efficiently, that, that timber and that fiber efficiently. And but we need to be careful that increasing demand isn't putting pressure on the world, increasing pressure on the world's natural forests. And I think we should be growing a lot more of that timber and that fiber here in the UK and growing it sustainably and well managed, well designed and managed forests and plantations. So to summarize, I think we need to focus on the big picture, big picture issues and on the roadmap towards zero carbon. We need to be thinking about land use strategies and we may need to be considering how we plan and regulate land use a lot better. We need to be much, much better about talking about trade-offs and nuance. We need, again, embracing this complexity. And I think we need to be thinking about carbon and agriculture and food and timber and rural communities. We shouldn't be looking at any of these things in isolation. And we really need to be talking about integrated land use strategies and how we better plan our countryside. Post-Brexit, we have a huge opportunity to have proper discussions about land management and foresters need to be at the heart of those discussions. Finally, back to, back, back to Jack Westerby, who said forestry isn't about trees, it is about people. Well, I'd extend that to land use in general. Most of the challenges we are grappling with aren't really environmental challenges or aren't just environmental challenges or economic ones, they're really social challenges. And in the UK, that's often connected to these rural communities, to our heritage, how we view the countryside, and how, what we value in our shared vision for the future. For me, that's what makes it really interesting. They've got this infinite puzzle and how we, how we, correct, how we fix this, how we solve this puzzle. And there's no one answer and it, it's an ever-changing puzzle. If forestry was just about timber or fiber or returns on investment, it would be really easy, but it isn't. It's much more complex than that. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope, um, I think I'm just about bang on time. And hopefully you've got some time for some more discussions and some good questions. As I say, I'm not, this is just, these are just some of my ideas. And the only way we'll come up with more sustainable land use is by listening, learning to listen and cooperate and talk to each other a lot more. So thank you very much again, Brian, for the opportunity to, to give this presentation. Hey, um, yeah, thanks very much, Andrew. That was really good, very thought, um, thoughtful and very inspiring. Uh, first off, I've got a, a question from Emma, Emma Goldberg. Can, um, Emma, about bioplastics, can you um, unmute yourself and, uh, and start the video so you can ask a question to Andrew, please? Hi, Andrew. That was a really interesting uh, talk. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about uh, what you said about lignin uh, being used in um, bioplastic. And I was just thinking, I, I don't know how many people on the call will remember Mike Seville, uh, who retired a couple of years ago, but brilliant. Um, but he was really advocating the use of fibers um, as, as a way forward and really saying, you know, that's where, people, where landowners needed to be focused on. And uh, just when you described it as bioplastic, it suddenly rang alarm bells with me because we're all anti-plastic now. And I wondered if you knew anything about what the impact of bioplastic is and how it breaks down and whether it's the same sort of threat uh, as, to our rivers and seas as plastic is. It should break down a lot. Sorry, that's thank you. For, thank you very much for the question. It's, I can, I probably best, I'm, yeah. bioplastics is a really big area. So at one end you've got kind of, and it's, covers a wide range of different plastic types. So in at one end, you, you're using basically um, carbon molecules out of trees as basically as a long carbon molecule instead of the long carbon molecule you're getting out of fossil fuels. And it, that includes, and then the other sort of side is you're using bioplastics that are much more biodegradable and are breaking down into their component parts of um, as, 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 uh, as normal, um, I'm trying to think the right, trying to think the right word to use, it will biodegrade in a normal way because they're not composed of composed of um, fossil fuel plastics. But again, the bioplastic. It's a bit like saying 
um, tree shelters. There's a wide range of tree shelters. When people say tree shelters are biodegradable, that covers everything from photodegradable or just breaking down into little bits of plastic to really kind of breaking down into carbon dioxide, water, and those components. So um, happy to, yeah, it, it, it covers a quite a wide range of things. So just bioplast, just be, I suppose what I'm saying is be, just be a bit careful when people talk about bioplastics as to what they actually mean. Um, Thanks. I asked my question quite early on, so I'm going to go back into the chat and ask all my next questions. Thanks, Brian. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, Colin, Colin Hawke, um, you got a question on provenances. Um, is there, Colin? Hi, hi, Andy. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Um, I'd agree with you that we need a far uh, wider range of species for for planting, um, but. There's, it's difficult to know what to plant and even if you know what species to plant what provenances and um, we do we really need to see more investment in research into provenances of a wider range of species that's i think yeah the easy answer to that is yes <laughs> um <laughs> yeah yeah and i think it's also having longer term trials so um I've recently, well, last year I, I got, I was invited or I applied to be on the, there's a government committee on forest science and I'm the, it's some very clever professors and I'm the kind of the, the practitioner on there who asked the, asked the daft laddie questions. And what, what there's a real interest in, and I think what we really need to support forest research in is having long, long-term trials and long-term um projects where we can go and try plant a wide variety of species and a wild, wide variety of provinces and go and have a look at them and see how they behave and i think that's we've we've lost that a little bit and i think there's a real there's a real there's a real need for that and as our as our climate changes you know very rapidly that there's increasing we need to we need to have these long-term experiments we can go and look at and it, 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 as ever, like everything else, it costs money and it's a real, it needs a long term sort of 40, 50 year commitment. And uh, that's a real challenge when DEFRA is cutting budgets um, left, right, and center. But I think, yeah, there's a real need for that. And we've all, I mean, it's the great thing about the Royal, the RFS is that you can go on these visits and go and see, go and see some of these plots and trials, and someone will tell you this was planted with this provenance or this, these seeds came from this woodland. Um, so yeah, the easy answer to that is yes. I think we do need more research, but like everything else, we're we're going to have to we're going to have to make some best guesses. I think as well. Um, thanks, thanks, Colin. Uh, Carolyn, you've you've asked the question about um, how about farmers and um, how they value their their fields. Uh, I think it's actually a really pertinent question. Um, can you um, put it to Andrew, please? Andrew. Um... I farm as well as, um, as, 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 as growing trees. And I, um, yeah, I'm try, trying to inspire my uh, local farmers to uh, plant more trees. They, they've spent you know, generations fighting trees. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a great mindset you've got to get through. Um, I'm just doing a silver pasture trial with North Wick down here and other folks. And, um, and, and my farmer virtually burst into tears when I told him I, I, I was planting trees in what we had, had in fields we'd had wheat in. So, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we sell it to them? I, th um, I think, uh, yeah, that, that is, one of, what is one of the big challenges. I went to, um, after I left school, I thought I wanted to do, I, I, I ended up in agricultural college because I didn't know what I really wanted to do. So I went to agricultural college for a year in North Wales and did sort of sheep and beef and I had no idea that there was a forestry unit in the agricultural college and I kind of did my year and I went off and did different things and about eight years later I realized that I really didn't want to be a farmer and um, I went back to the same college to study forestry and I was like oh that's what's in the porter cabins down at the end and and I did all a lot of the same lessons in soils and pesticides and fencing and everything else and learning you know driving tractors and I think those are there's a real need when I think it starts in the colleges of teaching people about that 
people often specialize into different types of land use quite early. And I think we could be teaching people the basics about a whole, whether that's conservation or, you know, gamekeeping or, um, or forestry or agriculture. And I think we would be teaching people a wider range of um, skills and knowledge. And I think that would help. I think the other thing is a lot of people, a lot of far, and again, broad sweeping generalization, but based on um, my ex-wife's family are hill farmers in North Wales. So I can, I've got some, not, some direct knowledge and I, I grew up in a farming community is that knowledge about prices, about timber value is is very hard to get. So I put up a slide at the beginning that had prices from Comfort's uh, magazine. And if you if you pick up the Farmers Weekly, the Farmers Weekly has weekly sheep prices for different markets all over the UK, and it's really difficult to find out what timber's worth. And I've I've gone to the Royal Welsh Show every year for since I was sort of knee high, and usually I'm standing on a stand for Till Hill or for um, Comfort or for somebody. And every year, every day of the show, someone will come onto the stand and say, "I've got." 20, 30 hectares of spruce or Douglas fir or something and say, is it worth anything? I had someone came out 10 years ago and told me it wasn't worth anything at all. And then you tell them, you know, saw logs at the moment, a hundred pound a ton delivered in and they've probably stood at 400 tons a hectare. And people are, a lot of landowners are unaware of that, the value there. So I think, I think there's a combination of things. I don't, I think it is, there's a generational thing as well. And I think, it's also that challenge if, if you have more farmers, more landowners planting trees, then more landowners will plant trees. But at the moment, you know, my, my background in North Wales with sheep farming, if you planted trees, it was yeah, you'd failed. You know, you'd you'd that's you know, why why weren't you farming? You'd let you were letting everyone down going to plant trees. And I think that's that's there is a I think it is changing, but I think it goes back to this need for good um agricultural advisors who are trusted who can talk about um, woodland creation and having woodland on the farm and I think um, sorry I keep saying yeah I keep saying about how great things are in Scotland things aren't perfect up here but the the SAC the Scottish Agricultural Consultants who are out of the Scottish Rural Colleges they have a forestry department and they they are they are the biggest SAC do more woodland planting than Till Hill or Scottish Scottish Woodlands, because I think they're a trusted organisation and they're seen as farming friendly and they talk the right language and have the right vocabulary. So I think there's no there's no there's no single fix to it, but I think um, it needs a and it and we need an integrated approach, to land use strategy, and we need Def, Defra to be talking about. Um, hopefully, Elm, Elms will help deliver that deliver that as well. Sorry, that was a very long rambling yeah. answer. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, good market-driven economics for forestry. That's great. Uh, Jez, Jez, you um, can you ask your question about international experience? Yeah, hi, great talk. Um, I am kind of interested in uh, whether there are lessons to learn from anyone else with your international experience. And I know that we, yeah, we often look at France and the Napoleonic forestry laws and the long traditions in Germany, but other places, even South America, Africa, Europe, wherever, that are ahead of the curve rather than just looking at ourselves in isolation? Or is the UK truly unique in its forestry that we have to find our own solutions? That's a, that's a thanks, Jez. Thanks for the feedback. And thanks, thanks, thanks. That's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> I th I think there's some really interesting things in. I suppose I'll do I'll do the two extremes. I'll do kind of scan Findo Scandinavia and I'll do kind of Brazil. Um, I think because that's that's I I haven't worked in much of Europe. I've kind of done work up in in Finland a little bit in Sweden. And I think the really interesting thing in Finland and Sweden is this is the concept the forest ownership and. Um, I think that Finland, the average ownership is about 12 hectares or something like that. So lots of people own own woodland. And there's obviously a forestry culture, a different forestry culture. And I think that's really interesting. And I think um, you have great examples of cooperatives as well. Sodra in Sweden is this huge cooperative of forest owners. And I think that 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 muscle that they have is really interesting. And I think that's that's 
a, a really good opportunity. I think it's a really good example of uh, a, a cooperative of forest owners working together and owning owning mills and forest management companies and everything else for the benefit of everyone together. So I think that's a good example. And then I think in in I've worked a lot in in Uruguay and in Brazil, and there it's plantation forestry, and they talk about precision silviculture. And I, I going between the UK sometimes I thought that oh, this is quite Im imprecise silviculture at times, but that idea of precision silviculture, and obviously this is what I was where I was working is eucalyptus, and it was on kind of nine year rotations, ten year rotations, but that focus on really if it's it's agriculture, it's agriculture on a ten year rotation but that 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 real focus on precision on good genetics on plant breeding on efficient use of land and very carefully planned everything from ground preparation to harvesting was all um big teams of logis logisticians planning it all i was that was hugely impressive and i think sometimes sometimes the uk sits kind of awkwardly between some of these different stools um I also think the UK, you know, we've got we've got a lot. Obviously, kind of the UK was one of the first countries to deforest, one of the first countries to do kind of plantation forestry, with a few others. One of the first countries to kind of get we were the uh, forestry creation was the first state forest service in the world to be have all their woodlands certified. So I think, yeah, as as ever, uh, I've been really lucky to kind of work in a lot of different places, and you do see, you do see a lot of common challenges and. Going that the Jack Westerby line about forestry isn't about trees isn't about people is is I suppose that's the common one, and whether you're talking to um, farmers in North Wales or farmers in North Wales or in um, in Uruguay about planting trees on their land that 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 the as the previous uh, uh, Carolyn asked the previous question about uh, about that why farmers concerned about growing trees is exactly the same that. Uh, their parents and their grandparents will have spent a lot of time kind of cultivating that ground and improving that ground and seeing planting trees as a step backwards. So I hope that answers your question a little bit, Jez. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, good on. Thanks, Jez. Um, uh, we'll go on to Simon. Simon's got a question on um, which tree species perform best in carbon in terms of carbon sequestration. So. Um, to save Andrew any speaking, uh, all I can say is that eucalyptus obviously is the, uh, the number one. Uh, actually, well, I've got to let Andrew talk now, sorry. Yeah, I took that for granted. Um, yeah, it, it's just, obviously that there's numerous considerations as to you know, choice of species, but I do get quite asked quite often, you know, what, what should I plant if I want to, you know, sequester carbon to the maximum? And there seems to be a lot of um, disagreement and differing opinion on this. And I, I just wonder what your take is on um, choices, be it conifer, deciduous and, and species and, and even methods of management, I guess. That, that it is, it is a huge, I, I spend, I, I'm spending quite a lot of time sort of talking to people about that. And I kind of, it's one of these things that kind of more, the more I, what's it, the more I learn, the less I understand, or the, I understand it, but I'm less kind of clear of kind of, what th there isn't a simple clear answer i think is the is the easy one and mm -hmm. if the woodland carbon co the woodland carbon code calculator is great but it's designed to do a certain thing and it isn't designed to give you that answer if, if i can, can be you know and you, um the the kind of the, the simple answer is in terms of in this kind of carbon sequestration, carbon storage, and then carbon substitution of you know using timber instead of they're three very different things. And often we talk often the language used is a bit loose sometimes when we talk about carbon stored or do we mean carbon stored in a hundred you know and what what problem we're we trying to fix. I mean in the easy the an easy answer is whatever grows fastest. With minimal with minimal ground disturbance, so that could be you know that could be eucalyptus or it could be um, silver fir or sitka, depending where you are in the world. But the the big issue, if you, what's the carbon code calculator does really well is can, produces you some quite nice growth curve graphs, and what you see with a lot of the graphs is they do that and they plateau, 
and as the once the forest is mature it, it plateaus in terms of rates of sequestration and that rate of sequestration gets confused with storage sometimes so obviously if you know the easy answer is you plant something that grows very quickly and you turn that into construction construction timber store it in a building and then you grow some more but it yeah, I suppose the the answer is we need kind of need more of everything, and we need more of we want is the what's the thing we're trying to do? Is it is we are we trying to suck as much CO two out of the atmosphere as fast as possible in the next twenty years, or are we trying to create large carbon stores um, in our forests and woodlands? And arguably, we need to do both. And then we are also need to re the thing we really really need to do is reduce emissions. And I think that's I think sometimes we 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 miss that. And it's that emissions reduction thing is, you know, carbon offsets are, carbon offsets is a whole other lecture, but, you know, if the, fo the focus needs to be on emissions reduction and growing more woodlands of all types for lots of different reasons. And I kind of use the carbon as a way of sitting, sitting someone down and then having a long discussion and boring them about forest management. So... Sorry, I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> That's great. That's great, Simon. Um, just as a, as a bit of a note, yeah. thank you, Simon. It's a, it's a bit of a note. The um, the greatest storage of, of any species type or group is uh, is the redwoods in the um, in North America. They store more carbon per hectare than anything else. Uh, obviously, they take a long time to get there. Um, I've got a question now from Robin Robin Walter um, about tree cover. Are you are you there, Robin? Uh, Robin, are you there? Yep, yeah, I am. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yep. Hi, Robin. Uh, uh, hello, hello, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there's a lot of talk about what we should aim for in tree cover. The um, in in UK at the current current currently we're at thirteen percent. The Climate Change Committee recommend nineteen percent by twenty fifty. Friends of the Earth want to uh, double cover to 26%. Um, I've seen other papers uh, repurposing all um, uh, land for, uh, for animals um, with trees, which would take us to about 60%. Um, that's probably more of a thought experiment than a serious proposal. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Thanks, Robin. Okay. I'm going to have a really bad reputation for not answering questions properly. Um, I think the, the, in some ways, our, our woodland cover is a symptom, is reflective of other things and other policies and other issues. And we've ended up with very limited woodland cover because of that focus on other, on, um, on, on agriculture, on our, um, on different types of agriculture in different types of places. So, and, what what's really interesting is if you look across um, much of Europe is that forests are expanding very rapidly and they're expanding rapidly through rural depopulation and kind of what in some areas is clearly kind of land land abandonment and um, whereas in the UK we don't have that in our rural areas because of again because of social and historical issues around the way we perceive and the way we value our countryside so I don't think there is a magic number and I'm always nervous about um, it's a bit like the carbon question if people start talking about millions of trees I'm always really suspicious about millions of trees if you mean tons of carbon say tons of carbon and not millions of trees or if we mean um, even something like forest landscape rest restoration IUCN have a very clear definition of what our forest landscape restoration means and it so I, I'm yeah I, targets and numbers are good for politicians and for holding um, policies to account and but they've also they also can lead to very a bit like kind of agricultural support payments they can to lead to very perverse outcomes um, but I think if we don't have targets and we don't have clear targets and clear numbers then we'll never we'll never we'll never get that change but I think if elms if elm succeeds it will increase woodland cover because we should be increasing woodland cover for biodiversity, for for carbon, and to be growing more timber. And we need we need a metric and we need a target. So, I don't know, eighteen percent, nineteen percent. The rest of Europe, you know, much of mainland Europe is thirty four, thirty five percent. But we've just got to be really careful in that we don't 
we don't regulate our we have a very quite a loose attitude to much of our regulation of our land use we don't we don't say well you've got too much sheep farming over there or there's too much um arable over there and um, whereas we do very tightly regulate woodland expansion so i just think we, we <laughs> Again, it's this sort of regulating woodland in amongst this wider sea, this wider landscape and wider land use discussion when we don't have a strategic approach to land use, particularly in England. We don't have a clear vision of what rural areas are for or what national parks are for. There was an online discussion all about national parks. No foresters included the other day. Um, so without that, the kind of, I suppose, that the... the the level of woodland cover we've got is an indicator of all these other, is, to my mind, to my, to me, is an indicator of all these other challenges and challenges we've got in discussing land use. So, again, I'm <laughs> I'm really bad at answering answering questions this evening, but yeah, we should have more woodland cover, and it should be yeah, let's have it up in the high teens. But again, just there are as the old discussions about where and forest today, are, you know, we are talking about very contested landscapes and. We're subsidising one land use when we're also subsidising. Yeah, you know, we're we're paying we're paying people to plant trees, but we're paying people a lot more money and have done for a very long period of time not to plant trees um, through agricultural support payments. So it's we're in a to use a good Scottish word, there's a bit of a stushy, and it needs we need to be having better, more open and honest conversations about about this strategic approach to land use or a strategic framework, and then that means a much, I think, probably more regulated approach to land use. And that generally doesn't fit well with um, a UK attitude to how we, to our countryside. Thank you. That's great. Um, I've got a question myself there on that point, uh, Andrew. To meet our needs, our wood needs in this country, or all of UK, how much do we need to plant? How much area? You know, are we looking at 25% to meet our sustainable needs? I think I worked out once that if we we currently offshore, offshore, I think we offshore about 80%, I think. But if we I think if we doubled our woodland cover, so up to about 26%, and then we managed our productive areas, um, a lot of our a lot of the calculations are based on uh, yield class 12 Sitka spruce. And we know that yield class 12 Sitka spruce is, you know, it's more like 16, 18 yield class at the moment uh, with the second rotation. So we're getting kind of 50% more productivity from the same amount of land. So I, th and I also think that we've got a lot of native woodland that is, um, could be managed productively as well. We've got real problems in parts of England with un unmanaged native woodland that could be managed productively, you know, traditional hazel coppice and oak woodlands as well. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I think I did some, when I was at COM4, we did some calculations. If we got to about double, then it would have put a very big dent in, in, our, in, our, um, in what we consume. That's great. Um, uh, Lord Clinton, we've got a uh, question from you about the climate crisis. Are you about? Well, Clinton, are you there? Maybe it uh, haven't caught up there. The uh, Lord Clinton asked a question about um, the climate crisis. Um, does it necessitate a radical response in forestry to to meet the climate crisis we've got in front of us? Yes, I think it necessitates a radical response in everything, everything we do, and how we live, and how we work, and I think that. I think the Committee on Climate Change have been really good. I think that some of their publications and their, some of their, the evidence they've brought forward and the recommendations they've been brought forward are, are really strong. And I'd like to see, I think they are influencing DEFRA and I think there are, they are having an influence on, on policy. But I think as well, I talk, I've been talking quite a lot to Bayes, um, business, business, energy and industry, and um, they're really interested in Things like off-site construction in around um, and biomass and bio different forms of bioenergy, and at times it feels like bays don't talk to DEFRA very much. And it would be great to see more connection between the two. And if if we're going to if we're going, there's a lot of demand for house building, and if we can, we need more. 
what's the phrase someone use? We need more houses in timber, not more timber in houses. And often um, we see a great enthusiasm for very heavy use of timber in houses, which is you know, good from a timber point of view, but we need to be using that stuff. If it's it's scarce resource, we need to be using it efficiently. So I think across all across all aspects of how we use um, how we use these scarce resources of timber and fiber and then how we manage our forests i think should the, um and how we address the climate emergency and the biodiversity emergency we need to that needs to be front and center right thanks thanks Dad. um emma i've got another question from you about resilience are you there emma hi there thanks hi again andrew um yeah i um i accidentally dropped this just to brian so nobody else will be able to see it um I, I was interested in your take on resilience, and you said that when you visited uh, the southwest, you saw some uh, oaks with uh, disease and some ash and beech with uh, various challenges of disease and climate change. And um, I, and you, you you then stated that in order to keep resilient forests, we needed to diversify the species that we grow. Um, I, I I wanted to bring you back to the beginning of your presentation when you talked about. The spectrum of different options to us from uh, commercial uh, 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 forestry through to uh, I think you said natural regeneration and rewilding um, because one of the big benefits of natural regeneration is that it allows for selection against pressure pressures like disease and climate change and that's an alternative to developing resilient forests that I don't hear talked about enough and I'm just interested in your views. Um. Yeah, the again, I'm <laughs> really bad at saying we kind of need more of everything, and I think we need, and I think this is the challenge we're competing over. Quite, um, we've got such small areas of new woodland expansion, should we say, every year that where it becomes quite a contested space of whether that's via natural regeneration or natural colonization of what and um, and of what species, and we're down to what did. England was sort of two two thousand two hundred hectares last year, um, and I, again, I think if we had a more oh, more grown up, better discussions about land management, we would be having we would have big areas of natural regeneration and scrub, which is you know um, obvious. NEP is the obvious, obvious sort of poster child for that, but I think if we had more of that, then we would have more natural natural variation, and we get that. Then the question about different um, provinces we could be planting more and a wider variety of provinces but often we're fighting over quite you know small numbers of hectares each year which makes it we seem to be having all these arguments and discussions about small areas and i think if if we were just doing this at much bigger scale then we could say right that over there we think is going to be great for natural regeneration we'll just let it go um that over there is some good you know, um, I don't know, grade three arable land. Um, it's not really working at the moment, the amount of chemicals and pesticides we need to put on it. Let's use that for growing eucalyptus. And it's ha it's just ha trying to have these more thoughtful discussions. And, and instead we seem to be, we often seem to be having, you know, kind of what I find quite frustrating discussions sometimes. We just say, right, well, that's, that's in the national park or that's, you know, we've got lots of oak woodland in there, or it's riparian woodland. Let's just man manage the grazing pressure and stand back and see what happens. Um, and I just think we need, what my, I suppose my big concern is, 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 and we particularly see this uh, in North America, some of the, the, uh, the US Forest Service are doing some quite good on this work around, what they call it assisted migration. And is, can our tree species evolve and move quickly enough to adapt and uh, adapt to climate change? And unfortunately, we don't, you know, we think they will, but if um, being, as I say, being in Devon in September and seeing all these brown beech trees on the tops of the hills was, and then going down into the gullies and seeing all the ash that was also dying was a real kind of, was a real wake up call for me. And, um, and how we, yeah, again, how we manage that resilience. But if we've got very isolated pockets of woodlands that are surrounded by agricultural land, then the opportunities for them to expand and evolve and develop is is pretty limited. That's great. Um, thank you, Andrew. I think at this stage, uh, I think we'll uh, call it a stop. Um, thank you, Andrew. I'm going to pass it on over to Malcolm to um, 
to summarize from uh, from our perspective. Um, thank you once again, Andrew. Thanks, yes, Brian. thank you, Andrew. Um, I, mean, I didn't welcome our um, our sort of neighbours from sort of Somerset and, and sort of Dorset uh, division as well. So welcome to them, um, and hopefully they won't mind me sort of um, summing up the evening as well. Um, but uh, I mean, we, we've heard you know a, a lot of a lot of thought provoking um, you know sort of questions and conversations and. Uh, you know, sort of from, from your presentation. Um, it's, it's, it's quite strange, I, I think, that a, a country that was perhaps, or a, you know, a nation um, that, that has a history founded on the importance of, of sort of, you know, trees and woods, and even if we deforested before everybody else, you know, we, we, we had a, a, a you know, a, a purpose for, for using the timber there. So, you know, we, we've had a, a very long history with, with, with trees and woodland. Um, we seem to have, uh, you know, a fantastic demand um, for for trees and woodlands, you know, um, in in the coming sort of decades. Um, so it is quite it's quite um, strange, really, that uh, we we just aren't able to put things together, um, you know, to to um, you know look as though we we've got a you know we're going to deliver that as easily as perhaps we should do. So um, I, mean, I I just wonder whether. We, we ought to revisit um, Jack uh, Westerby's sort of, um, you know, forestry isn't about trees, it's about the people, and, and maybe it is that forestry is about the trees, um, but their importance to people. And, and maybe when uh, we, um, you know, start to appreciate everything that trees can, um, you know, do for us, um, and, and every one of us, not just, uh, you know, the select few, then maybe that will, uh, that, that will be sort of a good catalyst for getting some, uh, some more woodlands, uh, sustainable woodlands in the ground. Um, so on that, um, I will sort of thank you once again on behalf of everybody. Um, thank everybody for coming along and, um, you know, hope you had a uh, you know, had, had a good evening and uh, in, enjoyed um, what you've you've heard. Um, I would normally say have a safe journey home, but um, as long as you haven't been sort of drinking your gin and tonics while we've been um, listening to Andrew, and then you have to sort of um, negotiate a steep flight of stairs, then um, take care all, um, stay safe and well, and um, look forward to catching up with you uh, later in the year. <laughs>